we're going to talk about running Redis in Kubernetes. And the reason why we did this workshop is a lot of the speakers here today are going to be giving you their code in a Docker container. And so we wanted you to be able to run their, their example code and their stuff uh, in a production-like environment so you can kind of test out what the other speakers are talking about today. And we said, hey, a really good way of doing that is to use Kubernetes. And a really good place to run Kubernetes is in Google Cloud. So let's just you know, walk some people through how to get that done. So we have a, wait, wait, one second. We ha so we have a GitHub repo. Uh, short link, if you can call it that, is myname.com slash gke dash reddish dash bootstrap. Uh, and that'll take you to this little GitHub repo. The repo is just a readme file that we'll be walking through for this uh, talk. And so a quick show of hands before we get started. How many people here are familiar with Kubernetes? A lot of people. How about Google Cloud? OK, so <laughs> we'll see how useful this, uh, this is. But uh, um, basically what we're going to do is make a cluster, deploy Redis, uh, deploy the service for Redis, and then deploy a sample app that connects to that um, Redis installation. Um, and so you should be able to take anyone's container from today and kind of run that in the same, same format. OK, so. In case you haven't noticed, uh, many of you, or at least all of you, should be having one of these. If you like the stuff that you're working on right now, there's a $50 credit on there. So I just want to make sure you get enough free stuff. Also, if yeah, if you, Amy's waving at the back if you can't see her. Yeah, she's got more. We've also got branded swag if other people want free stuff too. Uh, things to put your credit cards in that block RFID things. It's fine. Free stuff. Cool. OK. Cool. So um, don't expect you to follow along because we're going to go be going pretty fast. But uh, basically, what you can do once you go to this GitHub, you can click this button. Oh no, it didn't. I forgot to. Let's do this. Open oh, a new tab. Yeah. Yeah. And you do your two factor. So then it'll say you're about to clone the repo. You can hit proceed. Um, and what this will do. Who here has used Cloud Shell before? Yeah. Few people. Few people. Cloud Shell is pretty awesome. It's basically uh, if you ever used Google Cloud before and you just wanted to like do stuff really quickly in a terminal environment and an editor that's all in the browser, Cloud Shell is a really nice way of doing this. So we're going to actually use all our demos today. We're going to use Cloud Shell, and you'll see all basically all the tooling that we need to have available to us is available inside Cloud Shell without us having to download anything or install anything, which is super nice. So. You can see here, it uh, basically cloned it into Redis GKE Bootstrap Make 2, because I already had one. There we go. Let's make it very big. I'm going to say that. And so we're not going to use the editor. We're just going to use the shell. And so the first thing we're going to do is actually make our Kubernetes cluster. And so for this, you can basically run this command once for the whole uh, two-day conference. And you can run whatever you want in it. Um, we're going to make a pretty small cluster a machine, a two nodes of G1 small VMs. And you can change this to whatever you want. Again, you get $50, uh, the coupon credit. So if you want to spend that any way you want, go for it. Um, we're going to run that command. I'm going to <laughs> do that real fast. Run that command, OK. Um, and so now it'll create our Kubernetes cluster for us. So this is pretty much uh, normal Kubernetes in GKE. One command, you get your cluster. You get their masters provisioned for you, your nodes provisioned for you. Um, you can see it's bring, being deployed pretty quickly. Um, and so then you're automatically authenticated to that cluster, so you don't have to set up anything. Uh, Cloud Shell is really nice because it gives you all the tooling you need out of the box, so kubectl, Docker, or Helm. Uh, whatever you kind of need is kind of pre-installed. And so you don't have to worry about my local machine is different from your local machine and things like that. Cluster's being health checked. And then it'll be ready in about a few seconds. A few seconds. So a few of you aren't that familiar with Kubernetes. Um, we're not going to go into a deep dive on exactly what Kubernetes is. But the way I really like to explain it is if you have lots of machines, and you want to run software on them, this is a nice way to programmatically say, hey, I want you to run this stuff on these machines. 
Um, and it has a lot of really nice tools in there, right? So, hey, if this falls over, pick it back up, like restart it. Hey, if you're outputting logs, spit the logs out in, a, in an aggregated format so that you can reuse those. It has a wide variety of tools for basically running distributed systems at any kind of scale. Uh, so it makes it really, really nice. I want to show them um, the GKE console when that comes up too. Yeah. And we can start to look at some of the things that are happening. So Google Cloud comes with an integrated console, so you can start to see details about what's happening inside your cluster. Uh, this will be spinning up right now. Let's see what we got here. Or if you've got one that's already available. So we can start to see, this is all information that is available pretty much in Kubernetes. We just have a nice dashboard here where you can start to see like your cluster size, how many machines are in your nodes. Um, as we're building out stuff today, we can also have a dig into like workloads so we can see exactly what's happening inside. We can see metrics like CPU metrics, memory metrics. We can start digging into logs. We can start doing some really cool stuff that way. Um, have a percentage. Oh, that's new. I haven't seen that one before. It actually gives you a percentage about how much, how much is actually running. How's our cloud shell going? Master is healthy. Yay. So now it's just the, the nodes, and then we'll be good. OK, here we go. Cluster is ready. Beautiful. OK, cool. So we've made our cluster. Again, you can put, pick a bigger cluster, a smaller cluster. Um, this is just the bare minimum you need to kind of get Redis and a demo app up and running. So. The next step is to deploy to deploy Redis. So I'm actually going to use like the straight from the Kubernetes documentation uh, Redis deployment. And so I'm going to run these really quick, and then I'll, I'll show you what they are. So you can see that. I say kubectl apply, and I give it this uh, link. And so it'll actually go fetch that from the internet and then run it in my cluster, and then the service. So Mark, do you want to talk about? Yeah. As a general rule of thumb, maybe don't just run things randomly from the internet. But in this case, we know these pretty well, so it's fine. So um, yeah, so I was talking a little bit before as well about like programmatically we can tell Kubernetes what it is to do. So Kubernetes is a, a declarative system. It's a system in which we basically tell it what it is we want it to do, and then we trust it that it's going to do the things that we need it to do to make systems run. Um, can you pull up the YAML? Oh, you're actually yeah. going to do an edit? Beautiful. Um, so when we apply those YAML files, there's a series of commands in there that specify the things that need to be spun up. That's really small. Yeah, this is very small. <laughs> it's really small. Make that bigger. There we go. You know what? You know what I'm going to do? That's silly. I'm going to just. Yeah, we can just open that in the browser. That's easier. So what we're doing here is we're setting up a deployment. So a deployment is basically, hey, I want to run n number of this thing. Please make sure that it runs across the machines that I have in my cluster. That's really it. So it's speci specifying. Oh, that's fun. It is specifying. There we go. No. No, that's bad. Chromebook. OK, let me just do this. <laughs> oh, that works too. Yeah, Kubernetes. Just open it in the, or just open it in the editor. Let's do that. OK, so. There we go. Here it is. So we have a deployment. Here we go. So you can start to see some things in here. Um, see replicas? There's replicas one. So actually, in this particular instance, we just want one instance of, of Redis. We don't need multiple at this point in time. We're just going to do the bare minimum that we need to do to get things done. And if you scroll down, yeah, we can start applying. There's a bunch of things in here. But really, what we're doing here is just saying, hey, run one instance of, this, of Redis. Uh, we have some uh, CPU and memory constraints in here as well, so we can tell the schedule how to work and how much memory to give things and whatnot. We tell it what port it is that we want it to run on. But essentially, really, what we're just doing here is saying, have one of these up and running, make sure it always stays up. If it falls over, restart it, and you're pretty much good to go. Anything one thing, to one thing to notice is we don't have any persistent storage for this. So normally in Kubernetes, you would uh, spin up a persistent disk and attach it. Uh, because we're just doing this for the two-day conference and we just want to get stuff like running, uh, we're not worrying about it. It's just going to be storing yep. everything in memory. So there's no persistent yep. disk attached. Yeah, but you can do that. Like, if you want to put persistent disks, there's a really nice way of doing it. Uh, you can do uh, in a really nice cloud agnostic way as well. There's persistent, the persistent volume claims and all sorts of other good stuff there too. So if you need static file disks, you're good to go. So this is what we call a deployment. Um, and you can see all the deployments here on your workloads tab as well in a more GUI format if you don't like command line. Um, you can also see the service that we deployed. So the Redis master service. 
Um, important thing here is it only has an internal IP address, so we don't want people outside of our cluster accessing our database, obviously. So we are only exposing it as a cluster IP, so it's only internally routable. And then, of course, we can go and see our um, service YAML, and Mark can talk about that. Oh, sure. There we go. So services are essentially load balancers. Nothing, nothing more special than that. Um, because of the nature of the Kubernetes and the way we like to think about Kubernetes, right? Like everything inside your, everything essentially inside your cluster, like could potentially fail at any point in time, right? Software fails, so we assume that things might potentially fail, and we want to react accordingly. So if we've started up this Redis instance inside our cluster, we have multiple machines inside our cluster. If Redis for some reason failed or our co code failed, for example, it could start up on a different node inside a machine. Or say a node failed, we want that to move. Basically, all the health, health uh, responsibilities that we would want to have. Uh, we want to make sure that everything like, basically becomes healthy again and it, it, it heals. So services basically are set up so that, hey, if you have a set of pods, maybe one or more, and you want to be able to access those, Regardless of where they are inside your cluster, they're going to give you either an internal or an external IP address that you can then connect to, and it will do the routing to connect to those things. So here, so you can see here that the, uh, the way it finds those pods is by using these things called labels. So it's going to look for pods labeled app, Redis, role, master, tier, backend. And if you look at our deployment, they had the exact same labels on those pods, right? App, Redis, role, master, tier, backend. So this service is going to find those pods with those labels and then just connect them together. So pretty yep. cool. So that means now internally within our system, we can point at that service. And actually, what's kind of neat as well is within the cluster, um, we have a DNS entry for this, which has the same name as the service. So we can actually use that inside the cluster. We don't have to remember the IP address or anything like that. We can basically inside the cluster point at that DNS entry, and it will resolve internally as well, which is yeah. super nice. So just Red if you just literally connect to Redis Master, it is the IP address gets put in for you. Which Do is you nice. want to show the logs that we have in the dashboard too? Because they're handy. So if you go into uh, workloads, yeah, let's do it. This is all like stuff that everyone needs when running Kubernetes. So we can start to see our like CPU and 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 memory the memory metrics. They're not loading up yet, but we can even go down to the pod level. So here, here we go. Container there loads. There it is. Oh, that works too. Scroll down. Container. No, up, up, up. There goes fast. Oh, there it is. I just want you to show container logs. So like again, for those of you who aren't familiar with Kubernetes. Uh, you can do this on us, you can do this on other ones as well. This is the sort of stuff that we all need, log aggregation, it's just handy. Um, so we can see Redis is coming up. Uh, and it doesn't matter where it comes up inside our cluster, it's gonna aggregate our logs, put them in a place we can find it. Uh, we can basically introspect that. We'll see the same thing happening with our own services. It just makes it really nice for being able to debug your apps when things potentially go wrong. Yep. Okay, cool, so let's keep going. So now we have Redis kind of running on our cluster. The first thing that you want to probably do is kind of log into it and kind of start playing with that Redis installation. And so that's actually pretty easy with Kubernetes. We can actually uh, run in any pod that's running. We can kind of exec into it and kind of get a SSH tunnel uh, without worrying about credentials and things like that. So this command, what it's going to do is it's going to get first the name of that pod that's running uh, Redis and then run the exec command with Redis CLI. So if I literally just run this one line, um, I'm connected and I can say, you know, ping and I'll say pong. So we're connected to our Redis master and you can do whatever you want here. You can look at the data uh, directly. So, I mean, normally um, this is not super exciting. You can just run Redis on your local machine. But the difference here is it's running on our cluster and we just had to run like what, three, three commands and it's, it's up and running, yep. right? Let's, uh, okay, let's exit this. So you can do that at any time, and then just type exit to close that connection. Um, and the really nice thing is there's no firewalls, no load balancers, no uh, credentials. Everything's kind of taken care of for you by the G Cloud API, so you know how to worry about it. OK. So the last kind of thing before we go into like, a lot of questions is uh, how to deploy an app that can connect to that. So in this case, we have this little PHP guestbook. And so what I'm going to do is just do a kubectl run, and that's a very interesting command. Hmm. And it'll create this uh, deployment called guestbook. Um, so you can see here, I literally give it nothing but that image. And if we go to our um, workloads, this will spin up in a second, but we can go to our YAML here. 
And so it, the kubectl command line will actually generate this YAML for us so we don't have to do it. Um, and where is it? So basically we say the image is this uh, Google sample PHP thing, and it gives us a label called run PHP guestbook automatically. Um, and so now we can go back. It should be done at this point. There we go. It's OK. Um, so now the question is, how do we kind of access this, this uh, app, right? And so there's a few ways you can do it. Um, the way that we're going to do it for this the workshop is to do something called the node port. Uh, a node port basically opens up a certain port on all the nodes in your cluster. And then any traffic that goes to that port is automatically routed to the right VM that's running your uh, container or whatever, your service, right? Um, there, this is kind of like the worst way to get traffic <laughs> into your cluster uh, because now you have to deal with all the IP addresses of your VMs, right? The correct way to do it would be using something called a load balancer. Um, and Mark can explain that while I'm running these commands. Sure, that's, that's fine. Yeah, so node port's really handy if you're running, say, your own hardware and you want to put your own hardware load balancer in front of things. Uh, but it's also, well, honestly, on, Kuber on Google Cloud, using node port is the cheapest way of getting access to things. Uh, our load balancers tend to cost money, and we want to save you money for right now, especially for the next couple of days. Uh, so we're just going to give you this way. But um, you saw previously we were, we were creating a service, uh, and that was just being exposed internally to the cluster. But we can create a service and also expose that externally to the cluster, too. Um, and basically, the only difference between an internal and an external uh, service is it says type load balancer at the bottom. Uh, that's really it. You put type load balancer at the bottom. That then tells uh, GKE, hey, I want this exposed publicly with a public IP address. Um, and that's going to say to us, OK, cool, spin up a network load balancer, give it an IP address that people can access that's static. So then you can externally say, OK, if I hit this IP address on this service, it's then going to have, oh, I have labels that I need to route to. Right? I'll look at those matching labels, look at the pods that happen to be inside my Kubernetes cluster. And we're basically going to take all that information, go all the way through from our external load balancer into the service, down into the pods, and the pods can then serve information back up. In this particular case, we're looking at a guestbook. Yep. So first thing is get the node IP address. Obviously, I can go here into my cluster, um, click this, and then I can go to my node section, and it'll show me you know, the IP addresses of each when I actually look at them. So here we go. We can see here in our details, uh, wherever it is, where the IP it's is. In there, somewhere. there it is. It's somewhere. Uh, but there are easy ways. There's easier ways. Mostly it's just to go here and run this command, which is kubectl get nodes. And then we can say kubectl get nodes. Give me an L. Here we go. Um, so this will give us like the node information. And if you say wide, then it'll give us a lot more information, including the internal and external IP addresses. So what we need is basically any of these That's two tiny. IP. Oh, yeah, I know. Sorry. So any of, the, any of those <laughs> two help. IP addresses. No, I was kidding. Um, so any of those two IP addresses will route traffic to any container running in the thing. It's like a mesh network. So no matter where the traffic comes in, the Kubernetes networking layer will find the right place to put it. So that's really nice. Yeah. It's actually, it's actually worth noting. It's, it's, it's really interesting inside Kubernetes. Um, basically, it's set up with its internal networking system that any pod or any container running inside the system should be able to talk to any pod. This also means that so when we do node ports, if I have three nodes and I come in on this node, but the pod I want to connect to, it knows how to route that through that system, through that same network mesh, yeah. to whichever pod it needs to connect to, which is super handy. So what I did right now is like made some firewall rules to allow uh, traffic on these ports. Again, not required the normal way when you do it with the load balancer. Yep. Uh, you don't have to do this. And then I got the node IP address. Again, normally you get the load balancer IP address. And now what we're going to do is run this expose command. So this will create a service for us automatically, which is nice. And so if I say kubectl get service, you can see we have our PHP guestbook. Also, we can go back here into our services and see our PHP guestbook. And so you can see this is type node port, not cluster IP. That means it's being externally exposed. Um, and so now what we can do is get that, uh, get the port. 
So node ports are created dynamically. That's one of the things it does. It does it within a range. I forget what the range is, actually. Oh, it's right Doesn't here. Doesn't matter. 30,000 to 32,767. So a couple of ports. Um, just a few. Uh, but yeah, it'll dynamically find the, a port that's open and set that up for you. Again, this is stuff that we're just going to do to make things a little bit easier and save you a bit of money. Normally, you would use a load balancer, and then you don't have to worry about any of this. So you can see here the port that it automatically picked for us is 31829. Um, you can just run this command, and it'll actually run a port forwarding command for you automatically, which is really cool. Um, but we already did that with this step right here. And so now we can actually uh, visit that and so if you click this, we can see our guest book. And so now this, whenever I write something in here, like, hello world. Make that bigger. I don't know what's doing. <laughs> Does your button work? <laughs> Maybe I didn't do it. Your JavaScript's broken. I don't know what this app is. It worked last time. Let's see. Eh. Well, it's supposed to work. <laughs> um, I know. Let's see. So it exposed the app. Um, let's go check our, our database again. So again, we can connect to it. I have no idea what the, any, what the database even is Oops. that it connects to. know what the uh, no. list command is. I forgot. I don't, I don't really use the CL, Redis CLI that much, but uh, <laughs> this should have worked. Anyway, so at this point, it should be connected. Uh, what it does is it should look for that Redis master um, service automatically that we already deployed here, and it should connect to that. We can um, have a look at the logs. We can look at the logs. Let's do it. See, we broke it on purpose. No, we didn't. Go down. Container loads. Beautiful. This is what happens when you write use code that you didn't write. <laughs> what? I have a feeling it so, doesn't like the IP address. Yeah, it doesn't like the IP address. But you can see here, 10, 12, 0, 10. Um, if we go back to our Cloud Shell. It's not even the same. I have no idea what it's trying to do. It should be connecting to 10, 15, 244, 25. And that's what it should be doing. But for some reason, it's configured incorrectly. So when your container is configured correctly to connect to Redis <laughs> Master, It'll actually automatically resolve this IP address um, for you to use. I think it's actually trying to find the, the domain. Yeah, I don't know what it's trying to do. Um, I swear I was working before. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, well, maybe someone broke something. Something that's happened. It's okay. Anyway, um, cool. that's kind of like what we want to go through. This is going to be more of a hands-on workshop, but they kind of switched around the time, so we did what we could do. Um, any questions? We have tons of time for questions. And that's kind of what we want to focus the most of this session on. Uh, it's just questions. Ooh, headsets. Yeah. So we can hear questions. Any questions? Nobody had any. Oh, they're down the back. I love Kubernetes for like test and demo environments uh -huh. and uh, dev, obviously. In production, how much overhead would Kubernetes add if you're running like a serious Redis installation? Containers yeah. are pretty lightweight, but you know, networking and all the other things. Um, like I, I would prefer to put a database like on outside of a cluster, Redis, uh, outside of a Kubernetes yeah. cluster, and use Kubernetes for like my stateless apps, which will allow yeah, me to scale. I would scale. also recommend doing that. You've actually spun up bigger Redis clusters than I have. Yeah, so I, I also recommend uh, not running it on Kubernetes. Um, so in, this whole, in production. In production, yeah. So this whole workshop was basically like, just for this conference, if you want to try out other people's code, hmm. like how can you bootstrap it quickly? Um, 
But in production, yeah, I would probably use a managed service. Um, I mean, we obviously have Cloud Memory Store, um, but there's tons of managed services out there. Um, you can run Redis inside your cluster. The networking overhead will be very minimal um, because, so if you go through a service, there is a level of indirection. Um, but on GKE, there's actually a feature called pod IP aliasing. And what that lets you do is actually expose pod IPs on the side, like the, on, the, um, on the VPC na natively. So there's actually no, um, what's the word for it? The overhead. You go through a firewall. Uh, Extra latency. Natting. There's no, there's no yeah. uh, natting involved uh, on Google Cloud when you're using IP aliasing. Instead, Kubernetes knows exactly where it is and then just sends it directly to directly. And so you actually get the same performance um, as running it on like a VM with the hard-coded IP address. Um, so that, in that case, there's no overhead. But in terms of like management and like making sure the data is persistent and all that kind of stuff, that's why I still recommend running it outside. i probably I'll flip that around a little. I would say the the really sweet spot for running stuff like Redis or other sort of storage stuff inside Kubernetes, my personal opinion, is if you're working in an environment wherein you have services that are like dynamically being added or dropped from a from an environment. Um, so either you need like databases in a dynamic way or it's a very rapidly changing environment in which you need systems like that, like state, stateful systems to come up and come down on a regular basis. That can yeah. really help with your overhead in terms of doing that kind of management of like, let's bring up you know let's bring up a database and assign a disk and do all that kind of work. This can make that a whole lot easier. Yeah, if you're using so Redis for caching, then yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, like, pros and cons. Are you aware of any tools like this? So I'm giving a talk later today on using Redis cluster, and the cool mm -hmm. thing is you can scale out and yes. additional Redis nodes. Yes, yes. But I had to do it on bare metal, and I had to do quite a bit of DevOps work. Correct. So. <laughs> There's something called stateful sets, um, and they're literally designed to run database-like applications on Kubernetes. Uh, again, we do not go into any of that uh, because this is just like a test little app. Yep. Um, so a stateful set, what it lets you do is it actually spins up uh, replicas in a, in a um, ordered. ordered fashion, right? So it'll be like replica one, finish bootstrapping, replica two, finish bootstrapping, replica three, finish bootstrapping. Uh, and so this, this, this makes sure that you don't have like contention uh, and like leadership problems when you have like the cluster elections. Um, and so what it lets you do is basically say, hey, spin up a new disk that will attach to uh, the first one, and then like spin up another disk attached to the second one, and then do it in order. And so when you scale up and down, it actually remembers those disks. And so if you scale back down, it'll actually have those disks kind of in the background. And when you scale back up, it'll reattach it and then synchronize again, right? And so there's a bunch of um, like Helm charts and things like that that automatically have this, done this for you. So you can actually go find uh, Redis Helm charts out there that use stateful sets and you just kind of deploy it. Um, and then there's another level on top of that called an operator. Uh, and an operator is like a, a higher level abstraction on top of Kubernetes. I know Mark's written one, so yeah. he knows a lot about them. Um, if you want to. Yeah, sure. Um, and just so people are aware as well, so Helm's, Helm's a package manager for Kubernetes. Um, it's just super, super nice to be able to say, like, like if you ever use like APT or apt or something similar, you can be like Helm install Redis. Um, operators are also really nice. Operators are basically, again, extra levels above where you sort of declaratively we're able to say like here's a deployment, here's a service. Um, I don't know the Redis operator specifically, but you could be something like here's a YAML file that specifies what my Redis configuration should be. It should have this many nodes, it should be of this size, this cluster management thing. And then what should happen in like day two, day three, like you're, as you go down, you're like, oh, now I need more instances. So I edit, again, like I would do instead of like a deployment or a service, I can edit that YAML file that describes my, my Redis deployment and be like, I need five nodes or I need this sort of replication. And the operator's job is to programmatically be like, oh, you need this now, so now we know how to transfer you from this to this. We can make you expand, we can make you shrink, we can do all sorts of really useful things like that. Operators are super cool. I can talk about those for hours. Will it do auto scaling? Sorry? Will it do auto scaling? It might, so I've look, used I haven't the looked Redis at it. operator. Yeah. It, there's probably a few out there. Um, what it, what it, what it kind of does is it takes like the Redis primitives and then maps them automatically to Kubernetes primitives. Yep. Right? So basically you don't have to worry about like understanding how to do that kind of stuff on Kubernetes itself. You just say Redis scale five, and then it'll take care of like doing all the stuff under the covers. Yep. Um, so auto scaling can easily be part of that, right? Any other questions? Oh, we're gonna show the Redis operator at the keynote tomorrow, so there you go. I think Aparna is doing that one, right? Yeah, so. Sweet. Anything else? Nobody else. So again, this was kind of like a very, very quick um, kind of thing just to get you up and running, make, creating, you know, creating a cluster and like running the database on it. 
And again, the point of it was so you can go to other people's talks and take their code and run it uh, and try and experiment with that stuff. Um, obviously, their stuff is not going to be as simple as a guest book that doesn't actually work. Um, so if you do have more questions, come to the Google Cloud booth, yep. um, and we can help you kind of run whatever you yep. want to run and, or ask any questions on Google Cloud itself. Any other particular resources you like for learning about Kubernetes since we're here? My video series. You have a video series. Tell us more, Sandeep. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a video series. Uh, if you just search Kubernetes best practices, you'll find it. Um, don't have too much on databases yet, uh, mostly because I still am a little bit on the fence on should you run databases in Kubernetes, maybe, maybe not. Pros and cons. Uh, pros and cons. Uh, it's much easier to start and spin up things, but it's much also harder to maintain them long run, at least for now, which is why things like the operator make it a lot easier. Yep. Um, yeah. What also, the things I like, Kubernetes well, podcast. <laughs> uh, there's the Kubernetes podcast. There's that. I, I am one part of the Google Cloud Platform podcast as well. Uh, we talk about Kubernetes a lot. Um, I really like uh, Kata, there's a, we have one on our website, but also Kata Coda has them as well. They're interactive tutorials. So you, you don't even have to spin up a cluster. Uh, so Kata Coda, as well as on the GKE comic, uh, if you go hunting for that, uh, you can literally, it'll give you a terminal and you can start messing around with commands and you can start doing interactive stuff. I really like those as learning tools for Kubernetes. I think they're super, super useful. And yep, we'll Sweet. put up this video on that link too yep. when it goes out. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. All right. I'll give you guys back 10 minutes. Thank you very much.